Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Well, here we are. And they said I would be free to roam about the stage like some wild beast. I said, no chairs, no lectern. I just want to be in this intimate space, this naked space. <laughs> Because one of the, the, the paradoxes of art, of literature, is that it is at the same time both intimacy and lover's talk, the one-to-one, -one, the place we share, the place where nobody else can go. It's just you and me and we're together. It's that. And it's also the shared experience, the collective place, the place where we come together um, to celebrate, to meet one another, to know one another, to find things out that surprise us, or perhaps to have some of our prejudices blown away, perhaps to have some of our special moments cherished. It's all of that, and it comes together in this. And, you know, people sometimes say to me, well, you know, it's all very well for you, but you can go home and write your books, but art's not for everybody, literature's not for everybody, it's an elitist activity. You know, these festivals, they're just crazy. It's like kind of popcorn for the soul, you know, what is it really about? And it seems to me that if you think about art as a luxury, then what you're really saying is that being human is a luxury and that none of us have the right to be here tonight, that we should all immediately go out and start making money for Rupert Murdoch or somebody. <laughs> um, but I think it's more than that. And I think that all of us now in a world which certainly in the West uh, is largely secular, uh, in spite of intervention raids from the religious right, I think we do live in a secular society, but we do also wonder where the sacred has gone then we can't find language for that anymore. We can't find a way of expressing that anymore. The part of us that isn't to do with GDP, that isn't to do with the national debt, that isn't to do with gross income or the money you earn or your CV or what you look like above the event horizon, but is to do with the inner life, um, the place that we know exists. People keep telling us that there is no such place, but we know that there is um, because we find it in our dreams, we find it in our imagination, we find it in our emotional life. Sometimes the things that we We don't even dare to admit one to another. We find it in ourselves. And that's the place that all art and literature, I think, in particular, speaks to directly, um, both to confirm that it's really there and to shore it up, to celebrate it, to offer a kind of resistance. So it gives us a, I, I always think of it as a kind of platinum shield uh, inside of the self that allows us to ward off all those arrows and assaults um, that endlessly assail us from the outside world telling us that there were this or were that or were the other. And we think, but where in all of that am I? You know, the person who does have a soul. It's still a useful word, the soul. And so is the spirit. And I don't think that needs to be hijacked to religiosity or to the craziness as it is at the moment of fundamentalism. We need to reclaim those things for ourselves, the soul, the spirit. Um, not be afraid to have such things and not be afraid to speak out uh, in praise of them, in defense of them. And always, I think, to stand up for what we believe is important, which I think is the life of the mind, the life of the heart, these relationships that we have with one another and that we find in books and then when we talk to each other. And that's what I'm here for tonight, to talk to you, to read to you about why I'd be happy when you could be normal and to share this experience. So maybe there's some people here tonight who haven't read any of my books. Are, are there anybody in the audience? Would you, could you put your hand up if you haven't read anything by Jeanette Winterson? Oh, this is marvelous. I can see them there. Anybody up here, what Dame Edna calls the budget budgies, up here in the cheap seats? <laughs> No? Yeah, over here. Yeah, this is the really sad side. There's just a few of them, the strays. Um, well, this is, a, this is the moment then where I can save your soul. <laughs> you put your hand up. I know there's something missing in your life. <laughs> Brother, sister, you've come here tonight and you can share it with me because this is a gap. This is a place that we can fill together. You can find a way of leaving your emptiness here tonight in this concert hall and going away a different person. And all you have to do is probably spend $9.99 on a book by Jeanette Winterson. Look, it's better than Billy Graham. My mother wanted me to be a missionary. You could say 
<laughs> she got what she wanted. <laughs> because I am a disciple of the Word and an apostle of the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And for me, as a small child, words were everything. Language was, is, alive. Um, it wasn't a dry, dusty place. It wasn't a means of communication. It was, it is, luminous, um, lit up in every sense, um, a place to visit, a home. I don't think that books make a home. I think that they are a home. And when I was 24, I published a book called Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, which will take us back to the banana problem. And some of you will know about it. It's the story of a young girl. We might as well call her Jeanette. Why not? But he was brought up in a Pentecostal environment, and there's the story. I wanted to use myself as a fictional character. I didn't see why I couldn't. It seemed like a great idea. Um, of course, I've been dogged with it ever since, because you know, if, 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 Mel if Milan Kundra does it, or Henry Miller, you know, everybody in a Henry Miller book is called Henry Miller, but they're all novels. Nobody worries about that. If men do it, it's metafiction. If I do it, it's autobiography. Um, <laughs> I think, there might be, I think there might be some sexism here, but we're not allowed to call it sexism anymore. We have to call it asymmetrical judgment. <laughs> it's marvellous, isn't it? <laughs> so there may be a little bit of asymmetry in the judgment there about how you use yourself as a fictional character, how you become that place of, 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 of display and confrontation um, as a kind of genie out of the bottle, which is what I think we're meant to do when we make books. You know, we, we let something loose, something that's bigger than ourselves, um, that rises up to its full height and then cannot be contained and has perhaps special powers um, to take us places where we haven't been before. And I didn't expect, I suppose, 25 years after writing Oranges that I would ever come back to that material. I had no intention of doing so. It was not my plan nor my purpose. So it was as much a surprise to me as it was to everybody else when Why Be Happy When You Could Be Normal um, suddenly appeared as a fully-fledged manuscript. But sometimes books happen to you. You don't happen to the books. You don't form them, you don't plan them. It's like there's a sort of geothermal vent, you know those scary places at the bottom of the sea that suddenly spout up in a great geyser of energy and force you to go with them um, above the surface, over the event horizon, um, into your own unexpected place. And that's what happened with Why Be Happy. I was keeping a diary for myself about the journey that's narrated in the second half of this book, which is the journey to find my biological mother, um, Biomar as I call her. <laughs> I'd always thought she was dead because Mrs. Winterson, in uh, uh, one of her many dark narratives, uh, her endless Arabian night narrations of life, which broke off and continued from dawn till dusk, always veering off in a different direction. She was never a linear thinker. Um, so if you have a problem with my work, you know where to look. Um, <laughs> So there was Mrs. Winston telling me all of these stories, and she always used to say that my biological mother was either dead or drunk or on, drunk, on drugs, or that she'd exploded. And that was one of them, of an exploding mother that you've never met. Um, <laughs> And naturally enough, you don't want to really look too deeply into that place. You know, I thought that one set of crazy parents was enough. I mean, what on earth would possess me to go and find another set? You know, some, some kind of masochist, you know, what's the matter with you? You know, life is painful enough without adding to it purposefully. But I did find uh, some things, some paperwork, by chance, that caused me to think, A, that my mother was alive, and B, that I ought to go and look for her. But that comes later in the story, and the second half is really a kind of detective hunt for Biomar and what happens. But I'm going to read you a little bit from the beginning of Why Be Happy, um, which appropriately enough is entitled The Wrong Crib. So we'll now go and visit Winterson World. When my mother was angry with me, which was often, she said, the devil led us to the wrong crib. The image of Satan taking time off from the Cold War and McCarthyism <laughs> to visit Manchester, <laughs> 1960, purpose of visit to deceive Mrs. Winterson, <laughs> has a flamboyant theatricality to it. My mother was a flamboyant depressive, a woman who kept a revolver in the duster drawer and the bullets in a tin of pledge. 
A woman who stayed up all night baking cakes to avoid sleeping in the same bed as my father. A woman with a prolapse, a thyroid condition, an enlarged heart, an ulcerated leg that never healed, and two sets of false teeth. Matt for every day, and a pearl ice set for best. <laughs> I don't know why she didn't, couldn't have children. I know that she adopted me because she wanted a friend. She had none. And because I was like a flare sent out into the world, a way of saying that she was here, a kind of X marks the spot. She hated being a nobody. And like all children, adopted or not, I have had to live out some of her unlived life. We do that for our parents. We don't really have any choice. She was alive when my first novel, Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit, was published in 1985, and it is semi-autobiographical. It tells the story of a young girl adopted by Pentecostal parents, and the girl is supposed to grow up and be a missionary. Instead, she falls in love with a woman. Disaster. The girl leaves home, gets herself to Oxford University, returns home to find her mother has built a broadcast radio and is beaming out the gospel to the heathen. And the mother has a handle. She's called Kindly Light. And the novel begins, like most people, I lived for a long time with my mother and my father. My father liked to watch the wrestling. My mother liked to wrestle. For most of my life, I've been a bare-knuckle fighter. The one who wins is the one who hits the hardest. I was beaten as a child, and I learned early never to cry. If I was locked out overnight, I sat on the doorstep till the milkman came, drank both pints, left the empty bottles to enrage my mother, and walked to school. We always walked. We had no car and no bus money. For me, the average was five miles a day, two miles for the round trip to school and three miles for the round trip to church. And church was every night, except Thursdays. I wrote about some of these things in Oranges. And when it was published, my mother sent me a furious note in her immaculate copper plate handwriting, demanding a phone call. We hadn't seen each other for several years. I'd left Oxford and was scraping together a life, and I'd written Oranges Young. I was 25 when it was published. I went to a phone booth. I had no phone. She went to a phone booth. She had no phone. I dialed the Accrington code and number, and there she was. Who needs Skype? I could see her through her voice, her form solidifying in front of me as she talked. She was a big woman, tallish, weighing around 200 pounds. Surgical stockings, flat sandals, a crimpoline dress, and a nylon headscarf. She would have done her face powder, keep yourself nice, but not her lipstick, fast and loose. She filled the phone box. She was out of scale, larger than life. She was like a fairy story where size is approximate and unstable. She loomed up. She expanded. Only later, much later, too late. Did I understand how small she was to herself? The baby nobody picked up, the uncarried child still inside her. But that day, she was borne up on the shoulders of her own outrage, and she said, it's the first time I've had to order a book in a false name. <laughs> I tried to explain what I'd hoped to do. I am an ambitious writer. I don't see the point of being anything. No, not anything at all, if you have no ambition for it. And 1985 wasn't the day of the memoir. And in any case, I wasn't writing one. I was trying to get away from the received experience, from the received idea that women always write about experience, the compass of what they know, while men write wide and bold, the big canvas, the experiment with form. Henry James misunderstood Jane Austen's comment that she wrote on four inches of ivory, the tiny, observant minutiae. And much the same was said of Emily Dickinson and Virginia Woolf. And those things made me angry. In any case, 
Why could they not be experience and experiment? Why could they not be the observed and the imagined? Why should a woman be limited by anything or anybody? Why should a woman not be ambitious for literature, ambitious for herself? Mrs. Winterson was having none of it. She knew full well that writers were sex-crazed bohemians who broke the rules and didn't go out to work. And books had been forbidden in our house. And so for me to have written one, and had it published, and had it win a prize, and be standing in a phone box giving her a lecture on literature, a polemic on feminism, beep, 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 the pips, more money in the slot. And I'm thinking, as a voice goes in and out like the sea, why aren't you proud of me? The pips, more money in the slot. And I'm locked out and I'm sitting on the doorstep again. It's really cold and I've got a newspaper under my bum and I'm huddled in my duffel coat. A woman comes by. I know her. She gives me a bag of chips. She knows what my mother's like. Inside our house, the light's on. Dad's on the night shift, so she can go to bed, but she won't sleep. She'll read the Bible all night, and when Dad comes home, he'll say nothing, and she'll say nothing, and we'll act like it's normal to leave your kid outside all night, and normal never to sleep with your husband, and normal to have two sets of false teeth and a revolver in the duster drawer. We're still on the phone, in our phone booths. She tells me, that my success is from the devil, keeper of the wrong crib. She confronts me with the fact that I've used my own name in the novel. If it's a story, why is the main character called Jeanette? Huh? Why? I can't remember a time when I wasn't setting my story against hers. It was my survival from the very beginning. Adopted children are self-invented, because we have to be. There's an absence, a void, a question mark at the very beginning of our lives. A crucial part of our story is gone, and violently, like a bomb in the womb. The baby explodes into an unknown world, only knowable through some kind of a story. And of course, that's how we all live. It's the narrative of our lives. But adoption drops you into the story after it has started. It's like reading a book with the first few pages missing. It's like arriving after curtain up. And the feeling that something is missing never, ever leaves you. And it can't, and it shouldn't, because something is missing. That isn't of its nature negative. The missing part, the missing past, can be an opening as well as a void. It can be an entry as well as an exit. It is the fossil record, the imprint of another life. And although you can never have that life, your fingers trace the space where it might have been, and your fingers learn a kind of braille. There are markings here, raised like welts. Read them. Read the hurt, rewrite them, rewrite the hurt. It's why I am a writer. I don't say decided to be or became. It was not an act of will or even a conscious choice. To avoid the narrow mesh of Mrs. Winterson's story, I had to be able to tell my own. Part fact, part fiction is what life is. And it's always a cover story. I wrote my way out. She said, but it's not true. Truth. And this from a woman who explained the flash dash of mice activity in the kitchen as ectoplasm. <laughs> there was a terraced house in Accrington, in Lancashire, in England. And we called those houses two up, two down. Two rooms downstairs, two rooms upstairs. And three of us lived together in that house for 16 years. I told my version, faithful and invented, accurate and misremembered, shuffled in time. I told myself as a hero, like any shipwreck story, and it was a shipwreck. 
and me thrown on the coastline of humankind and finding it not altogether human and rarely kind. And I suppose that the saddest thing for me, thinking about the cover version that is Orange's, is that I wrote a story I could live with. The other one was too painful. I could not survive it. I'm often asked in a tick box kind of a way what is true and what is not true in oranges. Did I work in a funeral parlour? Did I drive an ice cream van? Did we have a gospel tent? Yeah, we did. Did Mrs. Winterson build her own CB radio? Did she really stun tomcats with a catapult? I can't answer these questions. I can say that there is a character in oranges called Testifying Elsie who looks after the little Jeanette and acts as a soft wall against the hurtling force of mother. I wrote her in because I couldn't bear to leave her out. I wrote her in because I really wished it had been that way. When you are a solitary child, you find an imaginary friend. But there was no Elsie, and there was no one like Elsie. Things were much lonelier than that. I spent most of my school years sitting on the railings outside the school gates in the breaks. I was not a popular or a likeable child, too spiky, too angry, too intense, too odd. And the church going didn't encourage school friends and school situations always pick out the misfit. Although embroidering the summer is ended and we are not yet saved on my gym bag <laughs> made me easy to spot. <laughs> Adoption is outside. You act out what it feels like to be the one who doesn't belong and you act it out by trying to do to others what has been done to you it's impossible to believe that anyone loves you for yourself i never believed that my parents loved me i tried to love them but it didn't work it's taken me a long time to learn how to love both the giving and the receiving I've written about love obsessively, forensically, and I know it, knew it as the highest value. I loved God, of course, in the early days, and God loved me, and that was something. And I loved animals and nature and poetry. People were the problem. How do you love another person? How do you trust another person to love you? I had no idea. I thought that love was loss. Why is the measure of love loss? That was the opening line of a novel of mine written on the body. I was stalking love, trapping love, losing love, longing for love. Truth for anybody is a very complex thing. And for a writer, what you leave out says as much as the things that you include. What lies beyond the margin of the text? Mrs. Winterson objected to what I had put in, but it seemed to me that what I had left out was the story's silent twin. There are so many things that we can't say because they are too painful. And we hope that the things that we can say will soothe the rest or appease it in some way. Stories are compensatory. The world is unfair, unjust, unknowable, out of control. When we tell a story, we exercise control, but in such a way as to leave a gap, an opening. It's a version, but never the final one. And perhaps we hope that the silences will be heard by someone else and the story can continue, can be retold. When we write, we offer the silence as much as the story. Words are the part of silence that can be spoken. I believe in fiction and in the power of stories because that way we speak in tongues. We are not silenced, all of us, when in deep trauma we find that we hesitate, we stammer, there are long pauses in our speech, the thing is stuck. We get our language back through the language of others. We can turn to the poem 
we can open the book. Somebody's been there for us and deep dived the words. I needed words because unhappy families are conspiracies of silence. The one who breaks the silence is never forgiven. He or she has to learn to forgive him or herself. God is forgiveness, or so that particular story goes. But in our house, God was Old Testament, and there was no forgiveness without a great deal of sacrifice. Mrs. Winterson was unhappy, and we had to be unhappy with her. She was waiting for the apocalypse. Her favorite song was God Has Blotted Them Out. I might sing that for you later. No, you have to wait. Her favorite song was God Has Blotted Them Out, which was meant to be about sins, but really was about anyone who'd ever annoyed her, which was everybody. She just didn't like anyone, and she didn't like life. Life was a burden to be carried as far as the grave and then dumped. Life was a veil of tears. Life was a pre-death experience. It's good that, isn't it? <laughs> Thought of that myself. Every day, Mrs. Winterson prayed, Lord, let me die. And this was hard on me and my dad. Her own mother had been a genteel woman who'd married a seductive thug, given him her money and watched him womanize it away. For a while, when I was about three until I was about five, we had to live with my granddad so that Mrs. Winterson could nurse her mother, who was dying of throat cancer. Although Mrs. W was deeply religious, she believed in spirits, and it made her very angry that Grandad's new girlfriend, as well as being an aging barmaid with dyed blonde hair, was a medium who held seances in our very own front room. After the seances, my mother complained that the house was full of men in uniform from the war. When I went into the kitchen to get at the corned beef sandwiches, I was told not to eat until the dead had gone. And this could take several hours, which is hard when you are four. I took to wandering up and down the streets asking for food, and Mrs. Winterson came after me, and that was the first time I heard this dark story of the devil and the wrong crib. In the crib next to me in the orphanage, there'd been a little boy called Paul. He may be here tonight. <laughs> Paul was my ghostly brother because his sainted self was always invoked when I was naughty. Paul would never have dropped his new doll into the pond. We didn't go near the surreal possibilities of Paul having been given a doll in the first place. Paul would not have filled his poodle pajama case with tomatoes so that he could perform a stomach operation with blood-like squish. <laughs> Paul would not have hidden Grandad's gas mask. For some reason, Grandad still had his gas mask from the war, and I loved it. Paul would not have turned up at a nice birthday party to which he had not been invited wearing Grandad's gas mask. <laughs> if they had taken Paul instead of me, it would have been different, better. I was supposed to be a pal, like she had been to her mother. And then her mother died. And she shut herself up in her grief. And I shut myself up in the larder because I had learned how to use the little key that opened the tins of corned beef. I have a memory, true or not true. The memory is surrounded by roses, which is odd because it is a violent and upsetting memory. My granddad was a keen gardener and he particularly loved roses. I liked finding him, 
shirt sleeves rolled up, wearing a knitted waistcoat and spraying the blooms with water from a polished can with a piston pressure valve. He liked me in an odd sort of a way, and he disliked my mother, and she hated him, not in an angry way, but with a toxic, submissive resentment. I'm wearing my favourite outfit, a cowboy suit and a fringed hat. My small body is slung from side to side with cap-gun coats. A woman comes into the garden and, and Grandad tells me, go inside, find my mother, who's making her usual pile of sandwiches. I run in, Mrs. Winterson takes off her apron and goes to answer the door. I'm peeping from down the hallway. There's an argument between the two women a terrible argument that I can't understand, and something fierce and frightening, like animal fear. And Mrs. Winterson slams the door and leans on it for a second. I creep out from my peeping place. She turns round. There I am, in my cowboy outfit. Was that my mum? Mrs. Winterson hits me, and the blow knocks me back. And then she runs upstairs. I go out into the garden, my granddad spraying the roses. He ignores me. There's nobody there. That's the beginning. I'm going to read some more in a minute. So you get the picture, it's going to be well worth the outlay. <laughs> the book's divided really into two parts, because it's about the overwhelming presence of one mother, Mrs. Winterson, and the overwhelming absence of another mother, the biological mother, the bio -ma. And in the middle, there's just one page which is called Intermission, where I tell you that I'm going to miss out 25 years, because I can. <laughs> It's irrelevant to this story, and I didn't want to sidetrack the story. And perhaps more importantly, I wanted to lay these narratives side by side, the one in the distant past and the one that came hard up against my present, um, butted into it, intruded on it, in such a way as to dislodge and destabilize me um, from the safe landing place that I thought was my life. And when that happens, when these, these, these great beasts come in and take us, um, these enormous things, we know that we have to respond in some way. We can't turn away, we can't shut the door, we can't hide. You know how we endlessly micromanage our lives. I mean, we're getting more and more obsessive, partly because we're in slavery to the diary and the clock and the calendar. But the important things, the big things, can never be managed. They always happen by chance, do they not? Somebody dies, we didn't expect it. We meet somebody, a stranger, we fall in love. Somebody leaves us, somebody comes, somebody goes. The job changes, we change. You know, all of those big things always sweep us off our feet. We're not ready. We're never ready. All we can do is prepare inside and hope that there'll be something about us, um, our character, our self, that enables us to meet whatever it is that life throws at us in these strange and random ways. There's no certainty. There's no insurance. Um, there's certainly no safety net. Um, but there is ourselves. And therefore, how we build ourselves, how we shore up ourselves, how we educate ourselves in the wider sense is what's so important and that's where we get back to these ideas about art and how it is that art will support us uh, rather than supplant us in our lives it's not something um, that doesn't want you to be uh, the master of yourself it wants to keep you in your own home in your own house in your own self and that's very important i think especially when these moments of dislodgement come along which is how it felt to me when i found my adoption papers which i'd never found before and it was a great shock and I found this, these ancient bits of paperwork. You know, anything that happened before the digital age now looks like it comes out of the ark, doesn't it? I mean, typewriting, you know, who knew? I mean, it always looks ancient and yellowy, and everybody's got all the mistakes and these bits of tipex. And you think, how did they manage? But they all did. And of course, I found these bits of paper, um, handwritten, typewritten, old forms, you know, no Xeroxing, all done in duplicates with carbon paper. Um, it looked like another world. It looked like something pre-arc, antediluvian. Um, and it was. But it was my life that was in that strange, lost world. And I had to go 
and look for it. And I kept a journal of what was happening through that detective story and then turned back to Wintersome World as well. But one of the things that I believe or that I've realised as I've got older is that our inner lives don't work according to the clock or the calendar or to any received chronology. That's not how it is. You know, our psychic processes are indifferent to time. And when we remember things, we don't remember them in sequence, not in chronological sequence at all. We remember according to the emotional significance of the memory and where it lies um, in our own collection of memories about ourselves and others. And that can be random and it can shift and it changes over time too. And, you know, there's been a lot of talk, you know, especially with the memoir, about what's a false memory, we know what's true in a documentary self sense, you know, what, what's received, what can we believe. But it's really important not to get caught in those black and white binary reductions of how we are. Human beings are very complex. And, you know, the hot topic of neuroscience this summer is really going to be about how memory itself is an act of narrative that you don't go back to a fixed point in time which exists preserved in, in, in a pristine state, um, like a fossil that you can discover and pull out of the ground. Not so at all. That memory itself as an act of narrative forces you um, to reconsider the whole picture, which is perhaps what we're meant to do. And certainly that's not about false memory. But you know how it is, sometimes you remember something that you think you know quite well, but because of where you are in your own situation, and you, a, a part of it will reappear or stand out from all the other things, and you'll think, I never thought of it like that before. Why this? Why now? And then that causes us to look at everything differently. And sometimes it's a huge shock, but it's obviously something that we need to confront, that our psychic processes bring up for us again and again. And I think literature really helps Helps us with this. And I'm very pleased that neuroscience has finally got the point. I mean, obviously, they've never read any Proust. You know? <laughs> Sometimes it takes science a long time to catch up. And then they put little wires on your head and they say, see, the bits of the brain light up so we know we're right. Um, but for all of us, you know, who've read deeply, uh, or whether you've been to the opera, the concert, or the theatre, thought about life, understood life from the inside out rather from the outside in, we know that this is how we remember and that we are not subject in our deeper selves either to the clock or the calendar or to that chronology that we live by. You know, we need to be in the 24-7 world, but not all of the time. We also need to protect and privilege those spaces in ourselves um, that are really not figured by the hours and the minutes and, crucially, are not up for sale, the time that belongs to us. And when we say that we don't have any time, that's the most tragic thing of all. Because time is all that we've got, and not very much of it. Um, and if it's always for sale, or if it's always hired out somewhere, um, whether it's some false god that we think we have to serve, you know, or to the craziness of the modern world, then we're losing that special place that we have with our loved ones, with our friends, with our family, with ourselves. And I think that matters. Because to me, everything on this planet is about relationship. And when things go wrong, it's when those relationships collapse or break down in some way, whether it's our relationship with the planet and with nature, with each other, with money itself, with time. You know, all of it is about connection. You know, we don't live in solitary towers. Uh, we live in a web, one with another. And that, I think, needs to be recognized and felt and understood. So that's why I wrote the book as I did. And although I think you'll find it quite an easy read, um, it's, it's a little bit of a crafty book because it does move through time, um, taking absolutely no notice of it as a chronological event. Appropriately enough, I will now read from chapter eight, which is called The Apocalypse, in case you were wondering when it's going to happen. Mrs. Winterson was not a welcoming woman. If anybody knocked at the door, she ran down the lobby and shoved the poker through the letterbox. <laughs> I'll leave you to fix that image in your mind. <laughs> and I suggest that you don't try it at home. No, not everything tonight can be an interactive experience. Part of the problem was that we had no bathroom. And she was ashamed of this. Not many people we knew did have bathrooms, but I was not allowed to have friends round from school in case they wanted to use the toilet. And then they would have to go outside, and then they would discover that we had no bathroom. In fact, that was the least of it. 
A bigger challenge for unbelievers than a drafty encounter with the outside loo was what was waiting for them when they got there. We were not allowed books in our house, but we lived in a world of print. And Mrs. Winterson wrote out exhortations and stuck them all over the house. And under my coat peg, there was a sign that said, think of God, not the dog. <laughs> and over the gas oven on a loaf wrapper, she'd written, man shall not live by bread alone. But in the outside loo, directly in front of you, as you went through the door, there was a placard. And those who stood up read, Linger not at the Lord's business. <laughs> and those who sat down read, He shall melt thy bowels like wax. <laughs> That's from the book of Deuteronomy, in case you want to look it up later. <laughs> This was wishful thinking. My mother was having trouble with her bowels. It was something to do with the loaf of white slice that we couldn't live by. <laughs> When I went to school, my mother put quotes from the scriptures in my hockey boots. And at mealtimes, there was a little scroll from the promise box by each of our plates. And a promise box is a box with Bible texts rolled up inside it, like the jokes that you get in Christmas crackers, but serious. And the little rolls stand on end, and you close your eyes, and you pick one out. And it can be comforting. Let not your hearts be troubled. Neither let them be afraid. Or it can be frightening. The sins of the fathers shall be visited on the children. But cheery or depressing, it was all reading. And reading was what I wanted to do. Fed words and shod with them. Words became clues. Piece by piece, I knew they would lead me somewhere else. The only time that Mrs. Winterson liked to answer the door was when she knew that the Mormons were coming round. And then she waited in the lobby, and before they'd dropped the knocker, she'd flung open the door, waving her Bible and warning them of eternal damnation. And this was confusing for the Mormons because they thought that they were in charge of eternal damnation. But Mrs. Winterson was a better candidate for the job. Now and again, if she was in a sociable frame of mind and there was a knock at the door, she left the poker alone and she sent me out the back to run up the alley and peep round the corner down the street to see who was there. I ran back with the news. But by this time, discouraged by no response, the visitor would be halfway down the street. So I'd have to run and fetch them back if my mother wanted to see them. And then she'd pretend to be surprised and pleased. I didn't care. It gave me a chance to go upstairs and read a forbidden book. I think that Mrs. Winterson had been well read at one time. Because when I was about seven, she read Jane Eyre to me. And this was deemed suitable because it has a minister in it, St. John Rivers who's keen on missionary work. Mrs. Winterson read out loud, turning the pages. There is the terrible fire at Thornfield Hall, and Mr. Rochester goes blind. But in the version that Mrs. Winterson read, Jane doesn't bother about her now sightless paramour. She marries St. John Rivers. <laughs> and they go off together to work in the mission field. It was only when I finally read Jane Eyre for myself <laughs> that I found out what my mother had done. And she did it so well, turning the pages and inventing the text extempore in the style of Charlotte Bronte. <laughs> the book disappeared as I got older. Perhaps she didn't want me to read it for myself. I assumed that she hid books the way that she hid everything else, including her heart. But our house was small, and I searched it. Were we endlessly ransacking the house, the two of us, looking for evidence of one another? I think we were. She, because I was fatally unknown to her, and she was afraid of me. 
and me because I had no idea what was missing but felt the missingness of the missing. We circled each other, wary, abandoned, full of longing. We came close, but not close enough, and then we pushed each other away forever. I did find a book, but I wish I hadn't. It was hidden in a tall boy under a pile of flannels, and it was a 1950s sex manual called How to Please Your Husband. This terrifying tome might have explained why Mrs. Winterson didn't have children. It had black and white diagrams and lists and tips, and most of the positions looked like adverts for a children's game of physical torment called Twister. As I pondered the horrors of heterosexuality, I'll read that again. <laughs> As I pondered the horrors of heterosexuality, I realized that I need not feel sorry for either of my parents. My mother hadn't read it. Well, perhaps she'd opened it once and realized the extent of the task and put it away. <laughs> the book was flat, pristine, intact. And so, whatever my father had had to do without, and I really don't think they ever had sex, he hadn't had to spend his nights with Mrs. W, with one hand on his penis and the other holding the manual, while she followed the instructions. <laughs> I remember her telling me, soon after they were married, that my father had come home dead drunk, and she locked him out of the bedroom. He'd broken down the door, and she'd thrown her wedding ring into the gutter. He went out to find it. She got on the night bus to the nearest town. And this was offered as an illustration of how Jesus improves a marriage. <laughs> the only sex education that my mother ever gave me was the injunction, never let a boy touch you down there. <laughs> I had no idea what she meant. She seemed to be referring to my knees. <laughs> Would it have been better if I'd fallen for a boy and not a girl? Probably not. I had entered her own fearful place, the terror of the body, the irresolution of her marriage, her own mother's humiliation at her father's coarseness and womanizing. Sex disgusted her, and now, when she looked at me, she saw sex. Thank you. I'm coming back. It's good, isn't it? I'll tell you where the title comes from, because Mrs. Winterson is a Shakespearean villain, so she has all the best lines, as they always do in Shakespeare. And when I was told that I had to leave home, it was because I had indeed fallen in love with another woman, and they tried an exorcism, they tried everything. But I was stubborn holding on to love, because it seemed valuable to me. And I've always been reckless in love, perhaps too much so. Um, but because I knew that love was the highest value, I couldn't simply give it up and say, no, it doesn't matter. Um, and it seemed to me that if God is love, and if God was the God that I'd been taught, that I'd been told about, surely that God wasn't going to be in a terminal decline because I was kissing a girl. It seemed unlikely. Now, even then, I knew there was a flaw in this argument about an omnipotent God who would want to micromanage the bedroom. Because I thought, if you've got a whole universe to play with, I mean, why would you? I mean, would you? You wouldn't, would you? You'd be having such a wonderful time, just creating planets and messing around with dark matter. You wouldn't be thinking, Jesus, there's a girl kissing a girl. <laughs> but Mrs. Winterson didn't think like that, and neither did the Pentecostal church that I was brought up in. So 
when it came to the day of reckoning, um, she said to me, either you give up the girl or you leave home. And I was 16, I had nowhere to go. I was about to go and do my A-levels. Um, so I was frightened. But what would you do um, in such a circumstance? That's right. So I packed my bag and I was setting off in, down the gloomy hallway um, where the poker spent so much of its time flying up and down <laughs> as if by magic. And she called me back. And she said, Jeanette, and I thought, well, perhaps we're going to have a conversation. Perhaps for the first time, we'll be on the same side of the glass screen that has always parted us. And I thought, she'll hear me. You know, we'll see each other. We'll speak. She said, tell me why you're doing this, because she took everything personally. And I said, I can't tell you, but I can say that it makes me happy. And there was a long pause, and she nodded, which she didn't often do. She usually shook her head, but she nodded. And then she said, why be happy? when you could be normal. <laughs> and she was a violent philosopher. <laughs> but to an intense and introspective child like me, perhaps that was a good line to leave on, because I spent really, I suppose, the, the next 35 years trying to work out whether that was a real question, um, and whether it was a true binary. Like black, white, good, even, male, female. I thought happy, normal, normal, happy. You know, are, are, are these opposites? Um, if I've got one, can I not have the other? You know, it's a real conundrum. I spent a long time worrying about this and unpicking it and, until finally I answered the question satisfactorily for myself, in so much as it is a question. Um, but that's what I took away with me. Um, and it's a sentence that has always stayed you know, to, to be worked at. I guess everybody here has got something like that, that you know that you'll spend your whole, the whole of your life, or at least half of it, um, trying to settle for yourself. And that's what I did. And the second half of the book is much darker. Um, I'm not going to say it has a happy ending. The last line is, I have no idea what happens next. But it doesn't have a false ending, and I think it has a very optimistic ending. I do find Biomar. We do meet, and the story is there unfolded for you, and what happens. But what I've understood from my reading, and I've read a lot, is that there are only three possible endings once you've got rid of the Hollywood uh, falsity of a happy ending. And those three endings are revenge, tragedy, and forgiveness. There is nothing else. Pick any story you like. Um, it'll entertain you on the way home. It's better than doing the business with the poker. Um, or trying to reinvent the sex manual. <laughs> Just think about those endings. And revenge and tragedy usually go together. They almost always do. And it's only forgiveness which allows the story to move on from that last page, from that finality, into a new possibility. And, you know, it's not easy to forgive. You remember Nelson Mandela said that you can forgive or you can forget, but you can't do both. And so it is, because forgiveness is itself an act of memory. You have to remember either what you've done or what's been done to you. There's nothing sentimental about it. There's nothing soft or easy about it. It's a huge thing because it's confronting what has happened, whatever it is. Um, and being able not only to see the situation, understand it, but somehow to pass through it um, the way light does through a solid object and come out on the other side. And that allows everything. And I suppose that has been the biggest lesson of my life. Um, to allow that forgiveness to take place. You know, there's a wonderful poem by Yeats, which I love, you won't mind me reciting, so which he, he says this, it's W.B. Yeats, the Irish poet, and he says, when such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows into the breast that we must dance and we must sing, for we are blessed by everything, and everything we look upon is blessed. And look at what the verbs are doing, because, you know, with language, the verbs tell you everything. They're the active part of the sentence. You know, the, the verbs really power it. If the verb's wrong, the sentence is wrong. And look at the first one. He says, when such as I cast out, what does that verb, like? what, what does it tell us? I mean, it, you can cast out demons. That's, that's physical. It's violent. It's something which takes energy. It takes effort to cast something out. There's that sense of necromancy there. There's, you know, there is the, the spell, the enchantment in it, and also the energy, the effort in the verb. When such as I cast out remorse. And then look at the next verb. So greater sweetness flows into the breast. And that's a lovely conjunction of language there, you know, within the first two lines of the poem that show us how this actually operates practically in the self. Poems are practical. Um, there's nothing 
Ponzi or Farty or Airy Fairy about a poem. You know, a poem is a practical thing. You know, it's solid, like a piece of furniture, maybe more so. Um, and it tells us how to do things. You know, they're good, they're good methods for living by. They're short and you can memorize them. When such as I cast out remorse, so great a sweetness flows into the breast that we must dance and we must sing. For we are blessed by everything and everything we look upon is blessed. It's lovely, isn't it? We're doing poetry night now. We give up on this. <laughs> oh, the song. Got, yeah, I think I'll do that in a minute for you. Because there's two, you see. Mrs. Winterson's favorite song, as you know, was God Has Blotted Them Out. Mine, um, being a, of an annoyingly cheerful temperament, was cheer up, ye saints of God. I love that. Fancy the saints of God being told to cheer up. <laughs> St. Peter, St. Paul, cheer up. Um, but that's the best of the low church evangelism, you know. There's something very homely about it. Cheer up, you saints of God. Um, there's nothing to worry about. Oh, it's a terrible thing. I mean, it's real rumpety tum stuff, you know. It's not as good as Yates. Um, but God has blotted them out. It goes like this. God has blotted them out. God has blotted them out. <laughs> I haven't finished yet. <laughs> My enemies mocked and scoffed at me. He blotted them out and set me free. God has blotted them out. God has blotted them out. <laughs> um, she was longing for the apocalypse. Well, it's, it's everybody would get their due. I mean, we, we used to rehearse the apocalypse. You know how some people have fire drills? Well, <laughs> not us, because um, we were living in end time. So, because Mrs. Winterson was, was, was a lot older, I mean, and she'd been a young woman in the war, and my father was in the way, he was in the D-Day landings, and Mrs. Winterson was there at home doing her thing. She was a home guard, she looked great in the uniform. Anyway, she had a war cupboard that she put tins in, but of course she never took them out. She was always putting things in, but never taking them out. So even, when I, even in the 60s and 70s, it was full of really frightening stuff like dried egg, you know, and... and cherries in vinegar, they used to do awful things like that, and powder, powder is everything, you know, it's amazing what you could get into a powder, and then, you know, this was long before NASA had invented freeze-dried, you know, it was all in Lancashire in Mrs. Winterson's cupboard, <laughs> she didn't need the space mission. Um, so the idea was that we would get all the tins out of the cupboard and take them under the stairs when the apocalypse happened and then wait for Jesus to liberate us. Um, but it wouldn't be Jesus himself, she explained. He would send an angel. And I used to worry about where the wings would fit because <laughs> the space under the stairs was really narrow. There was only enough room for the brush and me and Mrs. Winterson, you know. Oh, and the shoe polish too, yeah. That's true, I'd forgotten that. So, and the tins. So when the drill came, because what she'd do is she'd say, you're lying in your bed and you think that everything is normal. We, I never thought that. <laughs> <laughs> Not once. So you're lying in your bed and you think that everything is normal. And she said, and then there'll be a trumpet. <laughs> Which she used to play for me so I would know what a trumpet sounded like, you know. Um, so I was really au fait with the brass section of the orchestra. She said, there'll be a trumpet. I said, well, then what? Well, when you hear the trumpet, just get out of bed as you are. She said, you don't need to bring anything. Just come down in your pyjamas, go straight into the cupboard under the stairs, and I'll follow you with the tins. <laughs> and so, all right, so we did it. So we go dark. Dad was usually at work. I go to bed, pretend to be asleep, and Mrs. Winston had a little bugle. So we downstairs, and then she'd go, Poof! you know, the bugle would go, I think it's the last trump. <laughs> Get up, run downstairs, you know, it would all be lit by candles because, of course, we'd have had a power cut by then. I mean, you know, she did it all authentically. You didn't have to use her imagination, no. To so go down in the pitch dark, a few candles, into the cupboard, you know, where there was a candle as well, which was really dangerous because we could have just burnt the whole house down. And then we'd practice, but we wouldn't actually open a tin because they were too precious. So we just imagine what it would be like to eat our way through the tins. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Do you think I'm getting over sherry? <laughs> I think we're coming to the end, um, but I will be outside um, signing books and I hope you'll, you'll come and talk to me. I hope the queue won't be too long. And thank you for coming tonight, for being in this, this intimate, shared space. <laughs> Good night. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody up there and up there. <laughs> Even there at the back. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You're very generous here down under. <laughs> They're not like this in England, you know. <laughs> They'd be embarrassed. So, cheer up, you saints of God. I'll see you later. Bye.